king to Israel. This was the king that you had rejected with Samuel. When God says you've not, re- they've not rejected you, Samuel. They've rejected me from what? From being king over them. Now here, Pilate is declaring, "Here's your king. Here's his robe. They put it on the sign, and then the fact that he wears the crown on his head, the crown of thorns, as he spoke, and as you mentioned, uh, the 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 uh, tetragrammaton there, the yod heh vav heh." that it produced when they write it out in abbreviations there. Uh, I mean, it was obvious. This is the very, this was uh, the very God of Israel that was speaking to Moses from the burning bush. The the eighth Sinai, the thorn bush, was now speaking again from the midst of another thorn bush. Everything was telling the house of Judah that your king, your God, you know, the, two, the true uh, Yahweh, or Yehovah was, Yehovah, was standing there in a human body of flesh right before the people, and they didn't get it, you know? Yeah. No, Jesus. Yeah. And then we yeah. wonder yeah. why things is, are happening the way they are today, Steve. Oh, sure. But, I mean, you know, you know we both know, Stephen, that there was a spiritual blindness brought yes. on to the house of Judah. Yes. There was a spiritual blindness brought on, and it was brought on intentionally. This also is in the hands of the Father. Yes. It was brought on intentionally. And so the spiritual blindness that was brought on, okay, so we in the in the community, we, we of course pray that the Yahudim would have eyes that can see and yes. ears that could hear and have hearts of flesh. But on the same hand, we also play, pray in the Christian community that the Christians would allow the Ruach HaKodesh to convict them of the truth of the Torah, of the keeping of the commandments. You know, it's the keeping of the commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. This is the love of Yah. This is the love. This yes. is what John tells us, Jehovah tells us in 1 John 5. This is the love of Yah, is the keeping of his commandments. Mashiach himself says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Exactly. The, his commandments are not grievous. His yoke is easy, and his burden is light. And so, can people find in their hearts the forgiveness for one another? Can they find, uh, 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 you know, a gentleness and humbleness? Remember what Mashiach said, right? Come to me, all ye who are weary and burdened, and I will give rest to your souls. Right? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For what? For I am gentle and humble of heart. You know, here he was just hanging out with some really ignorant fishermen who couldn't read or write, you know, a tax collector and uh, and the townsman, right? A Yehuda Ish Kiryot, Ish Kiryot, Judas Iscariot, the townsman. And you know, so here he is hanging out with this group of people. Were they were they uh, uh, a smart elite group that was going to put up the killer website and all of a sudden, you know, get a number of hits on a, on a video that was going to go viral? No. They were in a world that had no printing, no publishing. I mean, you know, you have his handwritten scrolls. It was at a time it was impossible for this commitment, to, uh, this this understanding uh, of, of the coming of the Son of Man, that this would be known throughout the world. But it did become known throughout the world. But it didn't become known entirely because his name was hidden. His name was hidden. And it was hidden for a reason. And again, it was hidden for a reason. It's been hidden through all these years for a reason. Now, the veil... Was, un, was lifted when the time of Ezekiel 4, 5 was completed. Ezekiel is told, you know, go lay on your side for 390 days for the iniquity of the, of the house of Yasharel. And so he does. But in Leviticus 27, 26, verses 27, 28, it's written, that will increase sevenfold if you haven't repented. So it does, and it takes us to 2,730 years. Well, if you look at the destruction of Israel in 722 B.C., when does the unveiling occur? When does the unveiling occur? When is the iniquity of the house of Yasharel over? It's completed in the year 2008. And you begin to see this awakening inside the house. I have many, many friends who are in the community now whose awakening began in 2008. You know, this is when I was convicted. This is when I began reading that portion of the Bible where the the gold is still stuck together, you know, those pages are still stuck together with the gold, you know. Mm -hmm. I began reading those, you know, and seeing what is there. And now, of course, there is a new truth, not a new truth, it's an ancient truth, but it's being revealed. And, like, we've had so many people who've gone through the book of 2 Baruch, 
Baruch. It's called the Apocalypse of Baruch. It's, it's in the Sefer. When you read 2nd Baruch, the prophecies are so incredible. The book is so powerful. The people who have studied it have reached, even the skeptics who have studied it have reached the conclusion, this is an inspired work of Yah. And it's similar to what has been found in Fort Ezra. It's also similar to what you have, you know, so many of the expositions you've made on the book of Yashar, you know, and, and what is in Jasher, and, and how much is there in terms of the, uh, the, there's such a spiritual unveiling in the discussion of the life of Joseph, or in, this, in you know, and so forth. And you get a similar discussion. I, I just published a piece on my blog at sefer.net talking about the book of Hanok and the critical, in-your-face messianic prophecies that are there. You know, yes. this is my son, yes. the elect one, right? And we have found that it that is coordinated even through the Greek in this passage in Luke, you know, during the transfiguration where the two witnesses are seen. You know, they see, you know, uh, Kepa and Yahuk and John and Peter are sitting there with Mashiach up on Mount Hermon, right? They're up on Mount Hermon, and it's during the transfiguration, and they see Moshe and Elijah, Eliyahu. They see them, and they say, shall we build them sukkah, right? Because it's during tabernacle, shall we build them sukkah? And the voice they hear says, this is my son, hear him, right? But when you look at the Greek in Luke, there was a word that was left out because what it really says there, this is my son, the elect one, the elect one. And that fulfills, I think it's some 30 prophecies in the book of Hanok talking about the coming of the elect one. Yes. And so, you know, it's just, it's remarkable what's happened and what's, and what's coming now. And I do believe, and I think you know this as well, there are many, many uh, brothers, Hasids even, in Israel who go home and know the Messiah. That is true. That is true. And it's just, but they can't say anything about it. Uh, we have some that actually watch Israeli News Live. They've written me privately on multiple occasions. Uh, and they just say that you can't say a word. Uh, in fact, we have one sister that watches from Israel. And she said, there's no way I can tell my family that I have believed on uh uh, Yeshua is my own savior because I would be ousted from the family. Where would I go? What would I do? Mm, yeah, uh, sure. They'd hold a funeral for them. Exactly. They'd hold, and they'd be fired from their job, and they they lose their inheritance, and they, they you know, etc. I know, and it's a, it's a difficult situation. But we know that, it, it, notwithstanding that, the 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 truth is is that you can, and in particular, if you're a Hasid and you're living in Israel, you can still live. A, a complete life. You can live a complete life under the tutelage of Mashiach, under the blood of Mashiach, because, of course, you have the, the blessing of being in a land where you can keep the feast. You have a blessing of being in a land where you can keep the Shabbat. And so this is all part of a Messianic or Mashiachim life. This is all part of that yes. life. Yes. The diff the, and that becomes equally difficult in the Christian world. If you're a Christian and you're living in a church, a Christian church in America, and you say, well, look, I want to keep the Shabbat. You better keep your mouth shut in your Christian church, or they will boot you to the curb in a heartbeat. As soon as they know that you're a Sabbath keeper and a feast keeper, you will be expelled from the church. They don't want you there. And if, and if you tell them, well, look, why do I keep the feast? Because you don't keep the feast, and you don't keep the Sabbath, and you don't keep the commands of Yah because you're expecting salvation from them. You keep them because you love the Father. This is the love yes. of Yah, is the keeping of His commandments. And so the people in the church that are going to kick you to the crib, and, and the people, the churches that are kicking people out, and I, I went to a church, I mean, it was the last Sunday church I was in, and that was about, I don't know, five years ago, maybe. And we, we were staying at a friend's house, and she said, why don't you come to church with me? And Brad and I were there. I said, hey, Brad. You want to go to a church? <laughs> he says, yeah, yeah, okay, let's try it. So we go to this church, and we're walking across the parking lot, and I looked at him, and I said, you know, I'll put 20 on it right now that he preaches Colossians 2. And, yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't betting. I was just making a remark. Well, Brad says, okay, I'll take that bet. We walked, and we sat down in the church. We picked up the program. He's preaching Colossians 2. And he gets up, and this pastor, he gets up and he says, look, anybody who's teaching you to keep these commands, you need to rebuke them. Rebuke them. Get away from them because God is fun. That's what he said, literally. God is fun and there are no commands. 
there's only light boundaries. There wasn't a Bible in the place, right? The place was set up as a rock band concert. Uh, they had, uh, you know, the chain link fence up, you know, for the band to play in front of and all this. And I think, so I went, I went up to the pastor and I said, okay, I've got a question for you. He says, yeah, I said, what's that? I said, uh, Matthew 23, 1. Do you agree with that passage that says the scribes and Pharisees sit on Moshe's seat, therefore do what they tell you to do? Are you doing that? Oh, no, I don't agree with that at all. Why not? Well, that was nailed to the cross. I said, so let me get this clear. Are you trying to tell me that everything that was taught by the Messiah prior to being nailed to the cross was nailed to the cross? Yeah, that's right. So he's teaching his people that the gospel was nailed to the cross. Now, what, right? so what do you see happening in these kinds of churches that are teaching you're not under the law? You're not under the law. And again, when you say under the law, the word there that's used in the Greek, in 90% of the time that that word is interpreted, it's interpreted as of, not under, but of. So Paul is saying you're not of the law. Well, what does he mean? You weren't born under the law. You were born over here. You were born under a secular law. You were born in a profane world. You weren't born in a sacred world. You're not under the law. You weren't born in a sacred world. You were born in a profane world. Well, they take it as, I'm not under any law. So I tell people, you're not under the law. Okay, well, try that when you get pulled over for doing 75 and a 50. And the trooper says, son, you know how fast you were going? He'd say, officer, I'm not under the law, right? Try, try. See, see, it, it, won't, it won't be very successful. That's for sure. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you will. You know, the, uh, yeah, gosh, it's terrible, Steve. You know, but you know, the thing is, is the reason why we're seeing this happen to begin with, though, is because uh, in ecumenicalism, one of the things that they have to do is to do away um, with the teachings of uh, Yahshua. You have to take all of Jesus's teachings have to be become null and void. And even to the place, I believe, Steve, that they're going to actually try to say that he was only a prophet in order to be able to uh, uh, bring about tolerance with the Muslim community. They're going to basically teach it to where it's going to be as if it was the same way as the Muslim faith. In fact, the European Union, just uh, an announcement that was sent to me by a good friend of mine, Renze, who lives in the Netherlands, uh, it sent me an article that they're now declaring uh, that the European Union is going to become an Islamic nation. Uh, so we're seeing the the infancy, probably more than just an infancy, a rapid growing child, if you ask me, uh, of this tolerance. And you know something, Steve, speaking of tolerance, I haven't said this as, as of yet, but I keep meaning to say it. So I think today's a good time to say it. It seems like we're doing really good on live stream, other than when the dog was barking. Uh, <laughs> well, this program there, is a lot like a dog barking. <laughs> yes, there, I had nobody to silence the dog. Everybody had left, and all I can hear is a dog barking, barking, and no door to close. Anyway, uh, but at, at any rate, though, the the whole European Union is, is talking about going to an Islamic way. But as I was going to get to here... I was watching one of my most favorite cartoons of all times is The Prince of Egypt. Uh, I just have always liked this cartoon. And uh, and here I am an adult, but I like cartoons as far as uh, that type of cartoon. I'm not into cartoons, period, but that one I've always liked. But then I noticed something that kind of seemed to slip my, uh, my attention every time I've ever seen it. I never noticed it before. But if you really look at the cartoon, it's a cartoon of... Ecumenicalism, ecumenicalism, it is a cartoon of acceptance. And how you know this is when you watch Jethro in the cartoon, Moses' father-in-law, when he meets Zipporah and her sisters, look at each sister. One, modern-day woman, no, no covering on her head. The other one, she is a moderate Muslim with just the head covering on the uh, uh, and then you have the the last one uh, that the, the littlest little girl there which is the full face burqa everything face covered head covered 
you know, and I'm like, does anybody really notice that the Prince of Egypt is about tolerance? And I never saw that before. Uh, well, the, and again, I mean, Islam plays into the plan so well. I mean, it was Adolf Hitler who said, look, Nazism would have been a much better fit with Islam than Christianity because Christianity is way too independent. Particularly, even though they used Martin Luther's version of Romans 13.1, obey the governing authorities, instead of the true scripture that says obey the Torah, essentially obey the commands of Yah, because they're all commands of Yah. <clears throat> and so he used that to get the Lutheran church to force the German people into obeying the Nazi state. Barack Obama tried it in this country in 2010. He paid churches to preach on Romans 13.1. And many of the churches, a church a mile from my house was preaching, you obey the state and anybody who criticizes Obama, I want to be reported to me so that I can tell the relevant authorities. People are more than willing to come under a command and control, a totalitarian command and control. You have these kids who were at coming out of Parkland, you know, we want the constitution abolished. We want a totalitarian dictatorial state that forces us all to go in lockstep. Now, I can tell you from my point of view, Steve, we started out this conversation talking about this. I can tell you from my point of view, they can assert it if they want. It's it's got it its lifespan, it's got a half-life of maybe 30 minutes. It's not going to work because this country cannot function at all. It will not function. The, the, once you say, okay, frog in the pot, you're now boiled. Well then the frog dies. And when the frog dies, you're gonna find out what happened to communist Russia, which is that People stop working. They all become dependent, and then you have to feed everybody. And when that doesn't work, you're going to do the same solution Stalin did, which is to inflict terror by killing millions of people to force them to produce so that you have some tax revenue. And ultimately, socialism always fails when you run out of other people's money. And we've already run out of other people's money. We're the greatest debtor nation that's ever been in existence in the face of the earth. Ever. We owe the whole world about $200 trillion. Well, you know, it's funny you said you bring this up about what Stalin did because we have been seeing here in Eastern Europe, Steve, uh, on more than one occasion, there are people here wanting to go back to a socialist system, and which is probably exactly what the Vatican will do through Nazism as we see the rise of that in the Ukraine, fascism, of course, and that'll just breed into communism. Uh, but we were, my wife is speaking to some of the people here, and the reason why they're interested in socialism is because when the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, took place, uh, they introduced to the society, a society that had been built on socialism, uh, what they called freedom, which was now a, a, a capitalist type of economy. Well, you can't take a communist socialist ideology that, that Eastern Europe was under and convert it overnight into a capitalist economy and, to, and expect it work. So what's happened is the, 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 the rich uh, thieves of the communist system only got richer, and the poor people that uh, were very dependent upon the socialist system, uh, who all had a job, they had a, you, you were trained in whatever field you were in, you had to work in that field, everybody had a job, but also everyone had a place to live. Now these people that are struggling now because now they have unemployment, which they did not have before, and they're all wanting to go back to that system, at least the ones that, you know, that are struggling, and which is sad because socialism doesn't work either. Uh, I mean, until the Messiah comes, until Mashiach himself comes on this earth, socialism is not going to work. He is the only one that can bring about a socialist, socialistic lifestyle and make it actually work. And under, under Mashiach's tenure, you know, we're going to have a perfect government. But until then, there have been governments and places on earth that have been blessed. You know, the United States yes. was blessed when it was first born. Yes. And we took that blessing and, you know, and took it out, vandalized it, trashed it, uh, defiled it, uh, and threw it in the rubbish heap. And we allowed really psychopathic people, sociopathic people, 
to lead the nation into ever greater levels of iniquity. And now, really, the cup of iniquity is full in the United States. I mean, it really is full. There is no iniquity that this country isn't responsible for. Our leaders are really completely defiled and degraded, and they have allowed everything sacred in this country to be defiled and degraded. And they do it as a matter of law. So now what we see is we see judgment is coming on this country. I believe judgment has already been exacted on this country because the hand of the Father has just pulled away and said, I'm not protecting you anymore, number one. Yes. Number two, I'm not blessing you anymore. I'm not blessing you anymore, and I'm not protecting you anymore. And now this judgment that's laid out in Isaiah 14, the judgment that's laid out in Jeremiah 50, right? Jeremiah 50 opens up with this, and the word that Yahweh spoke against Babel, and the land of the Castine by Yirmi Yahu the prophet. You know, declare among the nations and publish, set up a standard, publish, don't conceal it. Babel is taken, Baal is confounded, Merodach is broken, her idols are confounded, her images are broken in pieces, for out of the north there comes up a nation against her which shall make her land desolate, and none shall dwell therein, they shall remove, they shall depart, both man and beast. And you know, when you can't do the things that are going on now, like what's happening in Syria right now, I had hoped that President Trump, after seeing what happened with the debacle, you know, last weekend, when we were on the verge of a nuclear holocaust, that he would have bowed out and said, okay, let's work something. What is our best, what's the best interest of the United States in Syria? We have none. But our allies in the region have a vested interest, and they snap their fingers, and we have to jump with our military to go over there. If the Saudis say go over there and stop Assad, that means go over and stop Assad. We want Sunni control over those oil fields. We want Sunni control over that land. And you need to get rid of that guy. Well, now, you know, just recently, you, I think you announced it on one of the shows you did. I think it's when the camera fell off the tripod. You were talking about the, the, the <laughs> row, row ships or whatever it was. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And you remember that ship that was offloading all that tons of heavy armor? Yes. And we also saw that happen in Lebanon several months ago, right? That there's, you know, there's, so you have massive troop, uh, not massive, armament deployment. You've got massive armament deployment. You still have those ships in the region. And now the Syrian troops, the last I heard, the Syrian troops had actually marched south to where they're on the border of the Golan Heights. They're on the border of the Golan Heights. They're facing, uh, you know, immediately at the border of Jordan. And there is an expectation that Iranian and Syrian troops are going to make a move against the base that the Americans don't have, but where we have troop station and armament station <clears throat> in the northern end of Jordan. The Turks have moved their troops in against the Kurds in the northern portion of Syria. And so you have really, there has been even more positioning for a ground war in Syria than there was last week. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, Steve, but I have not done the news on this as, as of yet. So those of you that are watching here on live stream, and I, it seems like we're still going pretty good there, uh, I have no idea what the comments are. So if you are commenting, I have no clue to what anybody is saying. <laughs> so anyway, so if you don't like us, we don't even know it. Uh, but uh, No barking. No barking. Yes, no. yes, please, please. No barking out here. Mumbai where uh, where the United States forces have been stationed there with the Kurds, where um, Erdogan has threatened to go in there and kill all the Kurds there as well. The, of course, the generals were saying they were not leaving. They are pulling out. They started pulling out yesterday. Now, that's not, to my knowledge, that's not main, mainstream media anywhere. Uh, some of the sources that we have on the ground there in Syria I have sent this information to me showing the U.S. troops leaving Mumbai. Now, that's concerning to me, Steve, because why are we willing to back away and just leave these Kurds hanging dry? Your thoughts? Well, again, yeah, again, when you're talking about the United States, where is our allegiance? Our allegiance is to, is to the military-industrial complex and nowhere else. Everyone else is collateral damage and is expendable. And the fact that the Kurdish state would be abandoned, you know, during the Bush administration, during W's administration, they had talked, there was a lot of discussion by the neocons of a three-state solution in Iraq. 
That is to say, break it up between the Kurds, the Sunnis, and the Shiites. And of course, the Shiites would have ended up with 60% of the country. Now, I sent a letter to President Bush at that time, and I said, this is an inaccurate American decision, because you should be using aspects of federalism. And so I proposed instead that they create a regional fund that uh, divided the fund from the oil revenues into 13 parts that went to the secular governments of the 13 provinces of Iraq. Well, that was actually embraced by the Bush administration, and it was immediately effective. It was all of the violence in the Anbar province or whatever it was out there in the, in the western section of Iraq terminated as soon as they had funding coming in. That was it. It was done. Over. Then, of course, with the Obama administration, they went back to the idea of a three-state solution with a Kurdistan, a proposed Kurdistan, and so forth. And the Kurds became useful actors in the war against Syria because you had another agitating force that could take a chunk of Syria, but the Kurds also want a chunk of Turkey. Now, the Turks, of course, have a very ruthless, what I would call an Ottoman attitude. They had a very Ottoman attitude towards the Armenian people in the earlier part of the 20th century, and they've taken that same Ottoman attitude towards the Kurdish people. If, if it's allowed to go unchecked, if the United States does nothing to check uh, the Turkish movement against the Kurds, it will be another genocide. Unfortunately so, Steve, I believe you're right there. And, uh, and this is something that has not been very popular with our friends that, that, uh, that do send, share information with us out of Syria because there's a lot of resentment amongst the Syrians uh, inside of Syria because uh, the Kurds have not worked out a better deal with President Bashar al-Assad. Although I will say that they have been in negotiations, they have been trying to work their differences out. Uh, and it's also something that has been very fearful of the United States is that the, that the Kurds would work out an agreement with the Syrian government uh, because that would just strengthen the military uh, that the Syrian army already has if they would actually finally come together. And of course, you know, Steve, too, that Russia was the first country to actually uh, say to President Bashar al-Assad that when this war is over and the new constitution is written, that there should be an autonomy for the Kurds because they have been very successful fighters there. But... To my own dismay, though, Russia has not done anything to help protect the Kurds uh, against the Turkish government. Now, Murad Gaziev with RT, he's a good friend of ours, and uh, we do correspond back and forth. And he has said to me before, it's not that the Kurds, uh, or that Russia would want to abandon the Kurds. He said they have to weigh out the options that they're, that they're dealing with because the situation is very delicate and the wrong move could escalate into a global conflict. Uh, so I guess maybe I should take that type of uh, thinking into consideration when Russia doesn't just jump at every uh, situation that's going on. But then again, we have to look at President Trump. President Trump uh, vows to be there for the Kurds, which it was only, which obviously I should say was only for the sake of uh, maintaining the oil in the region because ISIS had been uh, completely nearly wiped out by Russia and the Syrian forces there and their allies. Uh, but now, uh, now that Turkey is moving in, well, throw the Kurds under the bridge once again, as we see as they're moving out of Mumbai, and it's going to be open season on the Kurds very soon. And, uh, and that's very troubling because they have no air force. They have no S-300, S-400 system to back them up or any Patriot missiles uh, from the U.S., although they have been given some of the, uh, the U.S. tow missile systems there to help take out tanks, things like that. I appreciate that if Trump did they at least give them that to help defend themselves, but that's not going to stop F-16s uh, flying overhead, dropping bombs. Right. <clears throat> A very difficult situation, although I do believe here that there is prophecy that supports what ultimately will happen with the Kurdish people. And this is this prophecy out of Isaiah 19 and talking about this highway that's going to go from Egypt through Israel to ultimately Assyria. And I think when you look at that prophecy, I think you will see that there, there may be an ultimate solution here. And again, you know, uh, when I look at history, Stephen, if 
you know, one good way to really get an idea of history is to go back and get a map of the world that was printed in 1900. Then look at another one that was printed in 1935. And then look at another one that was printed in 1950. You know, the world changed dramatically over that period of time. You know, in 1900, you know, the Europe was dominated by the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. At the, and by the end of World War I, there was no Austrian-Hungarian Empire. You had Austria. The Middle East was dominated by the Ottoman Empire. By the end of World War I, you had Turkey. You know, and so you saw radical change. Now, radical change, I believe, is coming again. I think you're going to see that. Change happens, and it's going to happen not only in Europe and in the Middle East, but it's also going to happen in North America. It will happen in North America. The forces right now are so strong, you know, here on the left coast, we have a Jesuit order here that wants separation from the United States. Now, most of the people that live here in Oregon, Washington, California, do not want separation from the United States. But the governing class most assuredly does. And they believe that by cozying up to the Vatican and allowing the Jesuits to control the coastlands, and again, remember, my uh, concept that the Jesuits are the sons of Asher, those who control the trade cities on the coast, right? So you would see the sons of Asher, again, controlling the ports in Long Beach, the ports in the Bay Area, the ports in Portland, the ports in Seattle, all controlled by Jesuit factions wanting to control the coastland, and they want separatism from the United States. That's a huge push. There is a conservative movement, a so-called conservative movement, that hovers out of Texas, that says Texas has got the right model for running the country, and if the, you know, the libs want to, want to go off the deep end up in New England and the northern part of the country, let them have their own country. We will ally and, and uh, circle around what goes on in, uh, in Texas, and this will become uh, our capital, this will become our country, the central United States centered around Texas. Do you, so, do you see that happening, Steve? Do you think that we're that the United States may be split uh, uh, as a result of some sort of revolution? I don't think it's a big revolution that will cause it to split. It's economic collapse. The dollar already the dollar came up to a precipice of uh, significance when the Chinese launched the petro yuan successfully. They launched the petro yuan, and once they did that. The Chinese and the Russians have been moving to acquire Aramco, which was supposed to be an American IP initial public offering. Never happened because the Saudis don't want to have their oil fields audited. But the Chinese and the Russians are prepared to invest in that and to control that oil. The Chinese are investing in Africa in a huge way and in South America in a huge way. And you're seeing a move against the dollar, a significant move against the dollar. And Trump knew it. And this is why the threat came out immediately to destroy Damascus. This is why we're on the precipice of war, because the United States cannot tolerate a threat to the petrodollar. And the threat is not only on the table, it's in motion. What Russia and China and the BRICS have been threatening to do for, I don't know, 10 years now, they did. They did. And they did it successfully. And so as a result of that, China is going to assert its hegemony over the world now. They are a larger economy than the United States. They are the industrial power on Earth. They are now creating the largest military on Earth, and it's going to be the most armed and most capable in a very short period of time. We're at the point now, we, we've reached our peak in America. So if we're going to continue as the superstar here on Earth, then we're going to have to destroy China. And they, this is what they know. So we either accept our position as a declining power, which Britain did after World War II, we either accept our position as a declining power and learn to live as a neighbor, or we try to destroy our competitors as king of the hill. And there are the neocons who are in Washington, D.C., who are pushing right now, destroy, destroy, destroy. Yes. Hammer the Russians, hammer the Chinese, and then we'll go back to being a supreme power. But we will not because we've lost the intellectual capability to run an industrial nation. We've lost the intellectual capability to be a manufacturing center. And as the prophecy says in Isaiah 10, you know, you will lose the head and the tail. The intellectuals in the United States are going to leave, and they're going to go to a place where intellectuals are cherished, 
and not punished. Well, and, you, know, you know, Steve, what you're saying, let me just throw one thing in here as well, because we talk about the dollar actually falling. Um, when we first came to the Czech Republic uh, three years ago, when we go to an ATM machine, it's the easiest way for me to give people a, a realization of how much the dollar has dropped. Uh, we could get just a little over 10,000 crowns for $400. All right. Now, for the same 400 US dollars, we can only get 7,800 crowns. You're talking about, you know, 25% drop in the value of a dollar in an East European nation that doesn't have that strong of an economy, uh, Steve. This is, uh, and of course, the if you look at the uh, euro, there's a lot of similarities there with the euro as well. Um, you know, I had bought at one point in time, I had a little extra money one day, and I bought some Chinese yuan about, I don't know, two years ago. And then, uh, I mean, I didn't buy much, what, $500 worth of Chinese yuan. I wanted it just in case the economy collapsed. Now, what are you going to do with $500 worth of Chinese yuan? <laughs> You know, probably not much of, of anything, but right. you know, I thought about it, and and I and I even bought some Russian rubles. I think I have maybe about six hundred dollars worth of Russian rubles. But I bought the Russian rubles a little smarter, though. I did it when the Russian ruble is at the bottom, so if it ever does go back up, uh, it'd have a little, it'd have double the value, right? But right. the point being is that with our dollar going down so rapidly, I mean, this this is really sad. I mean, I, I really kind of wished I did have the money to buy, say, 10,000 Chinese wands. Well, that's not going to happen. But, you know, the point being is I see that big of a change. And now that they're trading on that, I, I mean, listen, you guys that are listening right now, especially on live stream, you want some good financial advice? I'm not a financial advisor. But uh, I would buy Chinese yuan. I mean, face it. I mean, they're trading oil and Chinese yuan, and our dollar is going down rapidly. But you know, everybody talks about buying gold. No, I'd buy Chinese yuan. You don't have to have no. You don't have to invest. You know, I mean, yeah, gold to me is at such a high, ridiculous price here. When things do collapse, your gold price is going to go boop <laughs> right to the bottom. Yeah, yeah, it very well could. I mean, you know, uh, of course, we're not, I'm, we're, you know, we're not in the business of giving financial advice, but, you know, the thing is, what we are, what we can say is giving prophetic advice. There you go. And the, there you go. And the prophetic advice does show, and I think it shows very clearly, that we're seeing this collapse. And so, from a geopolitical view, we can see that really what is very likely to happen is if we have a catastrophic collapse, if you look at the catastrophic collapse that happened in the USSR, the Soviet Union, that collapse happened in a single hour. And when it happened, every nation that was part of the Soviet Union seceded, we're out, everybody was out. And so now they call them the newly independent states, right? The NIS. And the NIS, everybody left and they haven't come back. And you know, Georgia's an independent nation, Armenia, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, all of those, Ukraine, all of those nations were part of the USSR. You know, Belarus kind of maintains a similar relationship to Russia, but other than Belarus, everybody else is independent and doing their own thing. And it happened immediately. All of a sudden, boom, you're in a separate country. Now what are you gonna do? The, the people in Georgia were going, we don't, we don't have the slightest idea what they were the poorest nation of all of the former Soviet republics. And they had no idea, what, totally corrupt, had no idea what to do. Uh, and so you're gonna see, I think you, you will see if we have a complete collapse of the dollar, the dollar goes to zero, the stock exchange goes to zero. If that were to happen, then you're gonna see a complete geopolitical shift in this country and people will realign their alliances. They will not go back to the dead model of this Masonic created uh, central government out of Washington, D.C., which is not at the center of the nation anymore. It's way over there. And, uh, you know, being an obeisance to the queen and, and taking orders from the pope and, and all of our creditors because the tail has to wag the dog because we can't, we don't have any other controls any other way. We can't be autonomous anymore. We're slaves. We're enslaved to our own debt. We did it to ourselves. 
Well, you know, yeah, Steve, so we, we talk about, you know, you mentioned the prophecy. I didn't mean to cut you off there, brother. Uh, but just a quick thought there, and, and please carry on with that. Um, in the, and you just have to take it, friends, for what it's worth. I, I, I don't, and I can't say to endorse it, but in the apocalypse of Abraham is, to me, it's prophetic it, it, as far as when we see what's happening. Uh, I can't say about the entire book, so I, therefore I say, you know, you have to really just pray about it. But... In this book here, there is an actual statement made that the world would, would uh, the Roman force, let's see, how does it put, the, this last day leader would bankrupt the world's economy with its Roman soldiers. Uh, now, if that's not a NATO force, I don't know what it is. But then he also goes on to say that this leader would take uh, the money from uh, the the uh, from the elderly and redistribute it to the poor. I mean, does that sound like socialism, the Roman Catholic Church to you, or what, Steve? I mean, it's almost like a NATO force, the Roman army. <laughs> you know, redistribution of the wealth. Exactly what Pope Francis is talking about. You know, he's always talking about redistributing the wealth. Uh, and of course, you know, when it talks about from the elderly, that's from the retirement funds and stuff. Because where does Americans have all their money tied up in? They have it tied up in stocks. They have it tied up. That's their 401ks. That is their, their retirement plans. And I can't tell you, Steve, how many people I knew, because uh, I know so many elderly people in 2008 when the economy took a big dive, uh, that had their monies in 401ks, had them in the stock market, because the 401ks were all invested in the stock market. And when it crashed, these people here that had had their retirements planned for their, for their remaining years were, were finding jobs at Walmart and Kmart and McDonald's and everything else because they had no way to pay their bills any longer. Right, yeah, this, and that kind of market manipulation all is all planned. They know that, and they fleece the elderly. And, you know, again, this is widely condemned in Scripture, that you would take from the widows and you would take from the poor. You know, and this is widely condemned as a yes. fierce corruption, fierce corruption that's worthy of judgment. And yet it's practiced nonetheless. And so, you know, in, you know, when we talk about capitalism, I, have a, I tend to favor a capitalism, even a laissez-faire society. But we haven't had capitalism in this country except for a few short periods of time. And they were only glimpses. And even then, you still have to have a regulated market. You have to have a regulated and a protected market. You have to protect your market. If you don't protect your market, the thieves will come in. So you have to you have to protect your market. You have to regulate your market. But with that, if you don't give people freedom of expression, freedom of thought, and freedom of autonomy to move in a marketplace to make themselves better, to build economies of scale, if you don't do that, you will eat the flesh of your own arm. And this also was prophesied in Isaiah 9, and this is what's happening in the country. People are eating the flesh of their own heart, and this is going on very rapidly now. So as part of this broadcast, even I'll just say this, and I think it's such an important time as this. We've arrived at that point where all of these events are now culminating. And even though lots of people thought, well, Trump will be our Messiah, Trump will be our Messiah, but there is only one Mashiach, and it's not a man. It's not a man. And... So what we see is we see prophecy now continues to unfold. The hook continues to be in the jaw. We have not departed from Syria. There is going to be a conflict there. There is we, we continue to send destroyers to agitate China in the South China Sea. You know, we have to send our battleships through there. And it's really pathetic, right? Well, we're not going to send a carrier group, you know, the old Ronald Reagan days. Let's send a carrier group through there and have 100 F-16s do a flyby, right? No, we only got enough gas now for one old tired destroyer. Send him through there. Say, you know, we're here. We're going to keep the strengths open. You know, and, 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 you know what I mean? And, and, then, yes. and then the Chinese show up with a four, with a 40 fleet battle group. Okay, well, here's how we're going to shut it down, you know. Well, you know, it's true. I mean, you're right. We, we're an aging country, even though we're considered a young country, because, I mean, let's face it, Steve, the United States sold us out. Um, the, the, you know, that's, they, that's they, right. They allowed, we were the greatest industrial nation on the planet Earth, and because they wanted cheaper wages and stuff, they sent it all over to China, uh, took advantage of the Chinese, because believe me, I'm not against the Chinese people at all. In fact, Steve, we have 
uh, a church in China, evangelical group, their church was shut down by the government, as you mentioned earlier. Their group was shut down by the government. They don't understand English. There's one precious brother there. Uh, I don't want to call his name because I don't want to put him in a hot spot with the Chinese there. But they found a way. They can't watch our videos, but they read the posts that we put online. They read the transcribed messages that I've taught on that have been transcribed before. And, uh, but they, these people have been taken advantage of by the American, the rich, wealthy Americans that wanted cheaper labor. And we're seeing the exact same thing, Steve, in Europe as well. For example, look at what Macron's doing in France right now. He's dealing with reforms. He's dealing with an angry French people. But you know what? The French government has done the exact same thing the American government did. They sold all their great manufacturing jobs to cheaper countries. Like, for example, in France, they moved their entire Peugeot, uh, Renault, all their car manufacturing was moved actually to a place not far from where I live, literally, you could walk there, uh, because why? The Czech people will work for a low wage, basically for the equivalency of $5.50 an hour, $6 an hour, you are a high paid, skilled laborer in this country here. Slovakia, well, you know, they sent uh, the, uh, uh, the Volkswagen dealership to Slovakia because they too are willing to work for less money than the Czechs work. And this is what happened in China. Well, you can imagine what the Americans were getting for the Chinese. And I know this, Steve, because I had a good friend of mine. He's a Jewish guy. I invented a, a, a very unique uh, machine that moves MRI machines back many years ago. And he loved it. And he says, but if we're going to manufacture it, we need to manufacture it in China. And I told him, no way. And he said, why not? He says, Steve, he says, my gosh, the money we would save if we manufacture it in China. I said, either you either manufacture it in the United States or you manufacture it in Israel. Because I either want the Americans or I want the Israeli people to be the ones that get blessed from the job for what we manufacture. I said, I'm not against the Chinese. I said, but that exp that's exploiting the people uh, so that we can make more money. I, I can't do it. So right now, we I never did it because of that. The Sepper, as you know, is uh, printed in America using American paper, all American products to do it. So we print out of, we print out of a, uh, we use a printer out of uh, Detroit and our paper comes out of Minnesota. And then of course all our people work out of uh, Montana where it's, uh, shall we say, a robust, cold environment. <laughs> made the, in the USA. Absolutely. Made in the USA, yeah. And we're so blessed by it because we have people that we can talk to. And when we have manual, when we looked at the Chinese option, the Chinese basically told us it's like this. We went to a big trade show and they said, this fellow told us, look, we print 75% of the Bibles you see on the, on the market today. We print them. And here's the standard. You buy this amount in bulk and it is what it is. If there's a problem, you're stuck with it because we're not taking anything back. We're not warranting anything, nothing. This is what you get. And then we went and talked to a fellow, a printer out of Belarus. And I actually, when I was, when I came to visit you in Prague, I was supposed to go into Belarus. And that's when I was, you know, I couldn't get out of bed because of the poisoning. But uh, otherwise, I would have gone in to see, visit our, the proposed printer in Belarus. They do a good job, by the way, great printer. But ultimately, we ended up with a printer that printed in Detroit. And they came to us and said, you know, we can print for you. And then not only that, but they gave us some printing options for some of our smaller books that have been extremely convenient, very helpful. And when we have a problem, we have some damaged goods or so on and so forth. Uh, we can go back to them and say, look, we had this problem with, you know, X number of books that were in this last shipment. They credit us, credit us the account. We sit down and talk to them. Let's talk about paper quality. Let's talk about the ink. Let's talk about the run. Let's talk about the position. We have a very good relationship with them. And as a result, we've had uh, a, a great deal of success in getting the book we wanted at the quality we want. And it makes a difference. If I've got a, a poor quality book that I purchased out of China and I'm selling it and people come and they take the book and they say, well, look, it's falling apart, right? What do I say? Hey, look, we got stiffed by our manufacturer. You're going to have to live with it. 
That isn't what we do. That isn't what we do. We have a repair or replace a warranty, and most of the time, if somebody has a problem with their book, they just send it back. We'll get them another copy. Exactly, and that's the way it should be, Steve. You know, mm -hmm. and, and that's. Uh, I mean, if we want to be true Americans, we need to stand, We need to do something to help support this economy. And unfortunately, as I said, many uh, Jewish businessmen that I know, though, they would rather go and save money and do it overseas or whether it be in Mexico or wherever they can get the cheapest labor. And unfortunately, in China, they still have the uh, the child labor and stuff. And there, there are so many issues there, you know, that... Uh, you know, I mean, even the books that I write, they're all printed in America, with the exception, I do encourage people that uh, if they order one of the books that I write, that they, uh, if they're overseas, order it from Amazon, from the country you live in, mainly because of uh, shipping costs. Otherwise, they're paying like $35 to ship a book that they can have printed in their own country. And at that rate there, if they're buying from their country, their country is getting the revenue. Not a whole lot in my case, but you know. But nonetheless, that's the way economics should work. And, you know, here's the thing. President Trump talked about doing this very thing that he was going to bring jobs back to the United States and everything. But what did he do when he signed this latest thing, Steve? There went your jobs again right out of the country. You know, you know, when, when you need money, I guess you're willing to sign on to any deal. And that's basically what he said. I have to have this money now. You know, we go from hand to mouth. The government is barely able to stay open. Yes. They're, you know, they have this. We have to, okay, we've got to extend the debt limit. We've got to extend the debt limit. Okay, why do you have to extend the debt limit? Here's a question for Congress. Why do you have to extend the debt limit? Because you haven't fixed the economy. And just because the Dow Jones goes skyrocketing up to reflect what the inflation of the dollar, which is right now running about 9%, this, so the Dow Jones goes rushing up. Oh, the economy's good. Why? Because the Dow is up. Everybody else is still unemployed. We don't have any manufacturing. We don't have any industry. We're, we're on a precipice of complete collapse of the currency. But the Dow Jones is up. Everybody can feel good today. Well, it's because they had to buy a whole bunch more bombs that they just lobbed over on some some other poor innocent nation, you know. <laughs> yes, Steve, we don't have this economy. The United States does not have to run off of war. And, and unfortunately, this is one reason why we are not blessed as a nation any longer, because we have our nation. Uh, and unfortunately, in the evangelical community has been taught to be warmongers. Yeah, it's you know? very true. Uh, we are we are taught. In fact, this is why President Trump is in office. He w he was put in there by the evangelical community, saying that he did not want to be in Syria. He wanted peace with Russia, and unfortunately, he's doing exactly the opposite right now. Uh, he's falling for everything that the deep state says to do. Yeah, and he falls for the false flag. That's he ends up with the hook in his jaw. It, it's and exactly right. If he would take the time, you know, if he would take the time to put together a uh, a group, let's say he puts together a group of maybe uh, 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 an entourage of maybe 30 people, and they make a trip into Russia, take a group of 30 people and make a trip into Russia and do a big diplomatic splash. I mean, you're talking about maybe spend seven to ten days there and, you know, really, uh, you know, enjoy Russian hospitality for a while spend some time, meet the people, see the country, and get some kind of first-hand knowledge of what's happening in Russia. If they were to take the time to do that, all of the air in this balloon of this you know, Russian collusion nonsense and demonizing somebody over there, those people over there, that's going to lead us into a war, and it will be a war that we will not win. We will not win this upcoming war. We will lose this upcoming war. Now, I know the Pentagon isn't telling you that, but if you look at the troops that are being marshaled against us, you know, the, what's the gospel say? First premise of war, count the troops coming against you. To see whether or that's, not you can go at it and win. That's right. That's the first thing. Now, some people say, well, Israel didn't do that because they were blessed in the 67 war and so forth. Okay, that's Israel. That's not the United States. We have been warmongering for 50 years. We've killed 30 million innocent people around the world. We bomb people any, any time there's the slightest disagreement or if we want to steal their stuff. And, you know, you can't go around the world. This is a finite planet. You can't keep going around the world bombing people and stealing their stuff and think that over the generations those people are not going to get angry and rearm with the stated goal of taking you out. 
You know, Steve, you, that's a good point you mentioned, and and I guess we ought to close before too long. I can't keep you all day on here, but uh, but I know people on 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 live stream are, are enjoying this. Uh, but that reminds me of there's so much issues going on right now. The United States is saying that the that the Russians are arming the Taliban. Uh, that they're finding Russian weapons uh, uh, in the hands of the Taliban right now. But it's funny how that as Americans, we have already forgotten that we were the first to arm the Taliban. And who are we arming the Taliban to fight against? The Russians. And the very uh, congressman that was the one that pushed that through, I forget his name, but he was a very, very strong congressman. He pushed this through. He really went to, to, to fight, at least the way that our history re reports it. I don't know if it's altogether true, but uh, to try to stop the Soviet Union from just killing innocent children and women that they were doing there. Now, I can believe that's possible. You got to remember, when you look, guys, when you look at the Soviet Union and Russia today, that's two different, two different creatures altogether. Still the same people. But it's a different group running the nation. The Soviet, former Soviet Union was ran by Jesuits. Uh, Russia is ran by Vladimir Putin, who is a professed believer in Yeshua as the Messiah. So, you know, I, I, I may not agree with the Russian Orthodox faith, but just to say there, there is a big difference there. Uh, now, I say this, though, because uh, we were arming the Taliban but when we pulled out, when, when the Taliban begins to be successful, the, the uh, congressman makes the statement. He says, look, we need to go in there and we need to build schools. We need to do things to help these people because these there, there's very few adults left there at all. It's just teenage boys and stuff. And they're going to grow up to hate us because we've never educated them to know, to really know who we are and what we did for them. And the, the Congress refused to help educate these people. So sure enough, it backfired on us. And years later, uh, now we're fighting the Taliban because the Taliban turned against us. Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with the Mujahideen. We armed the Mujahideen, you know, like a Rambo 3, or I think that was the name of it, Rambo 3, Sylvester Stallone. He's in Afghanistan fighting with the Mujahideen and exalting the Mujahideen as they take on uh, the Soviet Union. Well, the Mujahideen became Al-Qaeda. And their leader, Osama bin Laden, you know, became the top agent for Al-Qaeda extremism in the world, right? And that was a group that we funded and trained and armed and deployed. We used them even in the Bosnian War in the late 90s. So, you know, and we, yeah, we create a monster that then comes up against us. It's ridiculous. We end up, we have been at war in this country for the last 20 years, 30 years, let's let's call it since 1990, we have been at war with who? With ourselves. Yes. The CIA deploys assets, and then we go out and send the DOD to take on the CIA assets. I mean, it's 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 ludicrous, and we do this all in order to do further the defense industry. And then here at home, we are a top domestic industry, the publicly traded prison system. You know where where a governor can be fined millions of dollars because his judiciary has failed to fill the prisons with enough people? Okay, stick some more people in here. We don't care if they're innocent of a crime or not. You've got a contract to meet here, convict some people, and stick them in here. If you need to, create a couple of new laws and go out and start arresting more people. But those prisons have to be filled. We have a stock price that needs to increase. That's America right now. And you know, Steve, uh, by the way, he has his uh, doctorates in law. <laughs> so, so I guess we can say he has an authority to be able to speak about what's going on. And you know, Steve, with me working in law enforcement, I've seen far too many times, far too many times, where what I believe to even be innocent people uh, that got railroaded and convicted of things that I don't even believe they did. Uh, I've seen that too many times, and there is a loyalty uh, amongst these people here that, uh, that you know, when it comes to police officers, and then you watch all these beatings and stuff like that that they film, and it becomes uh, public, and, uh, and it causes outcry in the nation. And, of course, you see a lot of them, especially amongst the uh, black community, 
Well, let me say something to you, my black brothers and sisters. You would not believe they're not just prejudiced against the black people. They don't care who, what color you are. I've been there. I've seen it. And, you know, yes, I agree. The black community is picked on. There is no doubt about it in, in law enforcement. But they'll take, they'll do, they'll do a white person the exact same way, mistreat them, beat them. You know, because in, in law enforcement, it's like a mentality. These are the scumbags over here of the earth, and we're here to clean it up. That's the way they think. <laughs> that, that is it. That's it. Whatever it takes to do it, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Very sad situation. Guys, Steve, thank you for coming on, and I know we've kept you a lot longer. We were, we were literally talking about doing this for 30 minutes, but I think the dog barking kind of messed everything up. And then for some reason, you know, they say spinal injury is sometimes called sleepiness. And we get into this broadcast, and I, my eyes wanted to go to sleep, and I'm like, what in the world is wrong with me? Well, I remember if my spine gets into a certain position, it makes you want to sleep. And I, I never go to sleep, but I feel sleepy. And then, of course, I perked right on up after it finally unpinched in there. Uh, but it's been a real blessing having you, brother. And... Uh, listen, if you don't have the, the Sefer, uh, I really encourage you to get it. I have two of them, uh, and that's really, I have to say thanks to not only Brother Steve, who's, he's given us one as well, but we also had a, a precious uh, sister years ago sent us one uh, as well. So we have, we have one in Europe and one in America. <laughs> so we have one in both places there. Uh, but uh, definitely, if you decide to do it, it's also a blessing for Israeli News Live. You just, when you go to sefer.net, uh, whatever you choose to order, with the exception of the, uh, the app that you get, that doesn't, uh, but to get it, you definitely want to get it. Don't want to say not get it. But anything that you order as far as uh, materials that are shipped to you from the Sefer, uh, they, it also is a blessing to this ministry as well. So, and you get a discount. So you just have to put INL for Israeli News Live in there as a code. Uh, I don't know how many people are watching. It looks like the battery is almost dead, though, on our live stream broadcast because we are doing this by battery. Uh, but we do have uh, a lot of people in chat. I do see that. I did figure out a way while we were on there, Brother Steve, to click on the button. I can't read what nobody's saying, but we have 27, <laughs> 27 people actively chatting uh, uh, as, as this is broadcasting right now. Uh, or is it 110? I can't quite make that out from here. Uh, but anyway, thank you for watching all of you there on live stream. And uh, those the rest of you will catch it on YouTube a little bit later. You know, it'll be a blessing. We kind of covered a lot of topics here. Uh, Brother Steve, any last comments before we close? Well, I just think for the brothers and sisters that are in the faith, that are in the walk, you know, we're coming up into Pesach this weekend. Yes. It's going to, it's going to be a beautiful weekend. It's going to be a magnificent weekend. It's going to be the beginning of the spring feast. And let's just take joy for a while. Yes. The rest of the world may collapse around us, but we will come under the Father's wings, and we will take joy in this. We will celebrate. Amen. Amen. And I'm going to be doing some special messages on that. Maybe we'll slip you in here during the uh, Passover feast there, Steve, and we'll talk about something uh, a little bit more on the less stressful side. So. Amen. Anyway, Baruch Hashem, blessings to all of you out there as well, and... Uh, Get ready for Passover season as we're getting ready to start that there. And definitely pray for your loved ones. Pray for your loved ones. Try to win everyone you can to the Mashiach, to Yeshua, Yeshua, uh, because we are in a late hour. And this is the time. If you're ever going to do something for him, now's the time. Because as the old saying goes, when you get there, you'll wish you had done more. So let's try to do something today while we have time. As Yeshua said, we must work while it is day. I'm Stephen Brennan with Israeli News Live with our special guest, Dr. Stephen Pigeon from the Sefer Publishing Group. Shalom.